Good morning, Barbara. How are you? I'm quite well. Thank you. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join this series of Sentientist Conversations. And it's an honour that you've listened to a couple of episodes already, so you know the context. But in simple terms, it's a series of conversations about what I think are the two most important philosophical questions. You know, what's real and how should we choose what to believe? And secondly, what matters and who matters? Who gets to matter morally and ethically? So there's sort of two central timeless questions. And then we go on to think about, you know, what the implications of those answers might be for making a better world. Um, and I'm, I have a clear bias in these series because I'm trying to promote and develop this uh, idea of sentientism, which is a worldview I'd summarize as evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient beings. So it's a combination of a, a naturalistic way of understanding the world, if you like, using evidence and reason. And then it, when it comes to ethics, it talks about setting our moral scope of consideration, our compassion, if you like, uh, such that we grant uh, compassion and moral consideration to all sentient beings, any being that has the capacity to experience suffering or flourishing. Uh, but I'm so lucky in these conversations to talk to an incredible diversity of people, some of whom agree with sentientism and some of whom don't. So it'd be great to understand your own philosophical journey and your perspective. And so many themes of your work and your writing and your academic thinking play really richly into those questions. So yes, yeah, great to get the chance to talk to you. Uh, before we get into those deep questions. How would you best introduce yourself for people who don't know of your work already? Well, I'm coming to you from southeastern Virginia, where I live with my husband and six sentient beings also, six cats. We rescue cats, so we may or may not see anyone flowing through the screen as I'm talking or hear them. I am a biological anthropologist, an animal advocate, and a writer. So in 2015, I jumped ship from academia and struck out on my own to be a freelance science writer and public speaker. And all of the work that I do in any of these three roles really does center around questions of animal cognition, animal emotion, animal human relationships, and how we can make the world a better place for animals. So it's been a very interesting thing. I felt like I was jumping off a cliff a little bit, leaving a secure job that I'd had for 28 years teaching anthropology, just striking out on my own. But it was the best decision I've ever made. And I'm greatly enjoying having more, more time to do what I really want to do, which is to bump up that animal advocacy space and really get out there and talk to people in various ways. Uh, of course, through my books, uh, my TED Talk, and Good interviews like this one. Yeah, it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm not sure the audience for my little amateur podcast on YouTube will quite match the 3 million views I think your TED Talk has, but every little helps, I guess. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. And it's and it's it's fascinating for me because I, I'm not an academic in any of these fields myself, um, you know, very much an amateur, but I've spoken to many academics. And there seems to be something interesting about people who whose academic work focuses on the question of non-human animals, that it's they're almost inexorably drawn to advocacy and engaging with the real world. You know, it's, it's one of those topics where it seems almost impossible when people have understood the reality of the issue to just stick to the academic world. You know, there's almost this draw to advocacy and wanting to do something about it. That's so true. When I was, you know, coming up in graduate school, I watched Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, and other really sort of popular science heroes going in that direction away from scholarship to advocacy. And at that time, I did not understand it. Now, I started out doing field work on baboons in Kenya and also studying great apes in captive situations. And I was very drawn to the mix of quantitative and qualitative data and just focusing on these animals for what I could learn about them. But soon, it, over, you know, it sort of became overwhelmingly clear that I wanted to work for animals as well as on animals. And I agree with you. For me, that's a very natural emergence from coming to profoundly understand, you know, as much as I'm capable of understanding their degree of thinking, feeling, and being in the world and trying to deal with, you know, the human influence and the human impact on their lives. So I think now the advocacy part is the strong, strong you know, yearning that I have to, to do to do work rather than the scholarship. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I think as we go into these questions and understand your own journey, it will be great to understand, you know, some of the reasons why you've taken that path. So the first of these two crazily broad questions is, is what's real or how should we choose what to believe? So for many of my guests, that's a story about 
I guess the context they originally grew up in, was it already quite sort of naturalistic, scientific, maybe atheist agnostic in its mindset in terms of family and society, or was it more spiritual, mystical, religious, maybe supernatural, and how that side of their thinking about, I guess, the nature of reality and how to understand it has changed through the course of their life, if it has. So yeah, you can wind the clock back as far as you're comfortable to tell us your story on epistemology, I guess. I was growing up in New Jersey, suburban New Jersey, a small town called Shrewsbury. And at that time, at that place, at least in the circles I was, was living with, it was just natural to go to church, go to temple. And that's what I did. I was raised Presbyterian, so Protestant church in Shrewsbury. My mother had converted from Catholicism to uh, be Pres Presbyterian when she married my father in wartime in the 1940s. So it was just sort of expected in my community. And I was sent to church and to Sunday school. And I remember vacation Bible school, but it was very low key. It wasn't something that my parents particularly emphasized. It was just expected. One believes in God, one has a Bible in the home, one learns these things. Um, but I remember it as a church where we'd go to, say, the, the Strawberry Festival every June. The community would come together. It was a place for me to hang out with kids. It wasn't ever particularly a part of my identity. It was just kind of background. And my parents just didn't question that there was a God, that God was to some degree in charge of us. And I, I really kind of just fell into that. And then came college. I arrived at college in New Jersey. I went to the state school, Rutgers. My parents were very working class. They hadn't gone to college. This is the first person in the family to go to college. They were wonderful in seeding my life with books and music lessons. And they wanted college for me. But this was a very new experience for our family. And I arrived with my Bible. And, you know, like within two or three semesters, that was all kind of exploded. And... I started taking theology classes and religion classes and pre-med classes at that time before I discovered anthropology. By the time I left four years later, I was most definitely agnostic. And over the years, you know, I just became atheist and our family is atheist. I think a lot about that journey and why that happened. And I think it was just the idea of that most people experience who grow up in a small town and are sort of surrounded by religion, the idea of critical questioning and reading and thinking. And overwhelmingly, when I started to study anthropology and evolution, it just became clear to me that that was the path I wanted to follow, to understand science. And, you know, my parents didn't have a terrible time with that. It wasn't as if this was a terrible emotional break in the family. But it was a very new way of thinking to bring evolutionary theory into the home and talk about that. And my father died when he was 60. My mother lived much longer till 88. And at the end of her life, she came to me and she said, Barbara, I've been listening to you and reading your books for how many years? And I really wonder now, I'm really thinking about evolution. And I really wonder if what I thought all those years is really true. I really wonder if there's a God. And you know, Jamie, that really shook me in a way because it had been a bedrock of her life. And I admired the fact that in her 80s, when she was dealing with vascular dementia, she was open to thinking about these questions. And that just really, it kind of blew me away, Yeah, honestly. Yeah, it's impressive. It's impressive. And, it's, and the dynamic is interesting because I think for, for some people, they go through that process of engaging with you know, a scientific worldview. And as you said, you know, critically thinking about evolution and the implications of evolution for you know, what we are and how, how we came to be. And that is the break from a religious worldview completely. For others, um, they, they sort of, their religious worldview retreats, but it's still there, you know? So they say, okay, well, I acknowledge that evolution is true. And yes, the earth uh, universe probably was 13.8 billion years old, but I still retain a you know, religious worldview that recasts that and says, well, okay, maybe God was the origin of the universe, still plays some influence. So it's interesting that, what, was it because of that learning about science and anthropology and evolution th that was the break? Or was there a point where you were thinking, can I hold on to a religious way of thinking, even given what I know now? Yeah, no, it was just, it was just a break completely yeah. for the reasons that you say, and an immersion in science. 
you know, I had never understood until my junior year in college that it was possible to make a life studying monkeys and apes, which became my life and understanding, you know, the sort of evolutionary processes that I needed to understand in order to go and do that work, that foundation for understanding animal emotion and cognition. So personally, I was never particularly interested in reconciling religion and science. However, I did go through a very intense period in my career where I was interested intellectually, not personally, in that reconciliation. So I went um, with a group of colleagues for three meetings and um, a, a book that resulted from this, where we began to think about that bringing together a scientific worldview and a religion worldview. I went through a period of time of reading the Catholic theologian, John Hout, who I thought was really quite brilliant on bringing these two together. And yet it was a very much a separate thing, an intellectual questioning for me, whereas I had already decided, you know, that I was going to throw my lot in with science, reason, and that kind of thing. I have since left the realm of reconciling science and religion. I'm really not interested in that yeah. anymore. I went through a period of time, although it was a bit brief, where I was enamored of the Templeton Foundation and various questions that the foundation was raising. And it's now gotten to the point where I have actually refused money from the Templeton Foundation because I feel that the thrust of the questions that they're asking about reconciling science and religion is not where I want to go. And furthermore, it's not what I want to support. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know the deep story behind the Templeton Foundation, because I think there's a lot of good work they fund. But at the same time, you know, it's very clear there is an agenda there, right? And that, that has that sort of sense that, you know, insidious might be too strong a way of putting it, but it just makes me nervous, right? And whenever there's a clear driving motivation behind a theme of work, it's, um, you know, gives you second thoughts at least. So, that, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I've, I've had you know, brilliant colleagues who are good friends funded by the Templeton Foundation and their work is really exciting. But it is exactly the principle. I don't accept the claim that there's no agenda from the Templeton Foundation. The claim is made repeatedly and firmly, and I am not comfortable with it. So I made a decision just across the board after initially being involved with you know, some projects that were partially funded by the Templeton Foundation. So it's just a place where I've landed that feels comfortable to me. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And it seems like um, the drive was quite an intellectual one. It was about evidence and reasoning and a different way of understanding reality. Um, but there's another fact that affects some people's journey away from a religious worldview, which is more about the ethical implications. So for some people, it is more facts and evidence. You know, it was really mostly for me. You know, I just just doesn't feel like this is true anymore. It seems you know, these gods are much more likely made by man than the other way around when you learn about, you know, the full scope of different types of religions and a scientific worldview. So that was the facts and evidence. But but for some of my guests, there is also a drive where, you know, they didn't necessarily didn't look into the sort of truth claims, if you like, so much, but they saw some ethics flowing through uh, the religious worldview they were part of that they, they pushed back on, on whether it was homophobia or sexism or threats of hell or something else. You know, that was the trigger to make them rethink. Were there any ethical angles at all to your, I guess, movement away from a religious worldview? Or was it, I guess, such a soft background thing that you didn't see much of that? Oh, later, yes. I mean, to homophobia, sexism and fears of hell, you can, of course, add the idea of human domination or dominion over the earth. And, you know, I'm far from a biblical scholar, but it's hard pressed for me to read um, that text or other religious texts in a way that sort of gets around the idea of a, an extreme hierarchy with, you know, humankind at the top. And I know there are exceptions, certainly, in, in the religious, and I don't, you know, I can't really take that on comprehensively, but just in my own Christian tradition, certainly, um, that all of those things but they came later. I was definitely an evidence and evolution-based break. And then as that break occurred and went on in time, and I thought more, the ethical implications kind of rained down on me. And I realized why I was even happier that I had made this break, but it, I can't claim that it was a sort of precipitating factor that it, it, it wasn't, which is perhaps regrettable, but that's the fact of it. That's, that's, yeah. that's helpful. Thank you. And we'll come on to the ethical challenges in the second question in a moment one of the topics I don't often 
cover with my guests, but I, I have to with you because you wrote about this in your book, Evolving God, is where do you think that sort of supernatural mindset, you know, comes from? What are its origins? Why, why are, do we have this predilection to uh, have these types of belief? Yeah, I became so interested about 16, 17 years ago in understanding what I no longer was part of this movement towards belief. And of course, as an anthropologist, I wanted to get away from just thinking about monotheism and think about you know, the presentation of religion worldwide. So I started to really think about origins and I wrote a book, Evolving God, that claims that we can see the very earliest roots of what later became the religious imagination in animal lives. So the very first thing to say is that I'm not part of a group of people who sees religious expression in animals. I'll come back to that in a minute, but rather the roots, the very earliest roots of what later became religious expression. So for example, the idea that if we could take monkeys and apes as this sort of obvious um, evolutionary example that here are animals who are clearly conscious they are capable of imagination, imaginary, imagining things in their world. I, I could give examples. They rule follow in their groups. There are certain ways that things are done. And if they are, the rules are broken, there's often some kind of sanction. And there's also the capacity for empathy and perspective taking. And I think without these building blocks, what came later in human evolution would have looked very different. And I think that those enabled, in a sense, the ability for hominin and human minds to imagine other beings, other controlling beings, whether they be sky gods or other sorts of gods. And this was an interesting project for me to take on because it allowed me, in a way, to apply scientific reasoning to the origins of religion. That was a comfortable way for me to kind of explore some of these things that I'd left behind. And along the way, I ended up a bit unexpectedly in dialogue with other scholars who go further to say that we need to sort of explode our understanding of religion and make it not just a human sort of system, but one in which other animals participate. And while I disagree with this, those conversations became very, very interesting intellectually. So I could cite, of course, we know Jane Goodall makes the claim repeatedly that chimpanzees express awe and wonder at natural phenomena in the world, whether they be thunderstorms or waterfalls, and that this is an expression of spirituality at the chimpanzee level. But there's also the wonderful scholar Donovan Schaefer, who makes the claim that once we no longer tie religion only to beliefs and texts and think of it as embodied, emotional, and sensory, this opens up the ability to see that other animals have religion. And his argument is really fascinating, even though it's not one that you know I accept. So it was a very interesting period. Again, I'm saying about 15 years ago that I went through all this. Yeah, that was fascinating. And there's, at the very least, there's certainly some blurred edges to all of these concepts and how, you know, how they developed. Um, but I think that's a theme that runs through many of these conversations is, is that it's really instructive to look at the pre-human roots of um, much of the way we think in many aspects. And religion is just one of those. Yeah. I mean, here we know that the religious impulse is, in one sense of the word, universal, clearly not to the individual level, but at the cultural and society level, some kind of religious spiritual impulse is, is there. And that absolutely fascinated me. You know, I often argue with people who say, if something is universal in human society, that means it's automatically innate. I don't think that that is a correct uh, equation. So, you know, I think things could have gone another way, that this was a very contingent thing in which so much religious imagination evolved, but it did evolve. So clearly to me, that implies quite strongly that it's worth a search for primate and other animal roots for this. And I do really see a lot of continuity. I mean, we know that Franz Duval, for example, has written along these lines as well with the primate origins of morality, the primate origins of what might later you know, be considered religious impulse. Yeah, yeah, I was lucky to have Franz on as a previous guest as well. Would you describe yourself, I mean, we, we focus often when we're talking about this sort of naturalism versus supernaturalism as two grand 
you know, choices, if you like, about how to understand the world. We focus a lot on religion, um, given its prevalence and its, you know, power and uh, how broadly spread it is. But it's not the only form of a supernatural belief. Have there been any other times in your life where you've been tempted by something that was beyond the naturalistic in terms of uh, beliefs, whether it's a, a broader sense of spirituality or you know, other forms of maybe less firmly founded belief systems? Or would you describe yourself now as sort of relentlessly naturalistic in your worldview? I think that I am relentlessly naturalistic, but you know, for a time, I'll wind the clock back, as you would say, a little bit. You know, I started out um, being very strongly rooted as a biological anthropologist in primatology. So I went to Kenya. I did field work with baboons. I then did this filming work that I alluded to briefly earlier, where I would watch grade eight families in captivity and film their gestural communication. And I was brought up as a graduate student that is very strictly to think that primates are kind of at the top of the cognitive and emotional hierarchy of non-human animals. So I really thought that I was working with animals who were profoundly different. And even though I was beginning to reject anthropocentrism, I was, you know, unwittingly participating in a kind of primate centrism. And then I began, you know, being in Amboseli, Kenya and, and being uh, able to read and look more widely to read about orcas and elephants, other mammals. And gradually, you know, concentrically, my circles began to widen in understanding who is thinking, who is feeling. So that now I'm fascinated with the whole sort of range of animals. And I, you know, have a love for bison and octopus and spiders and, and think that they're all sentient and thinking and feeling. So the point in regards to your question is that at one point I became sort of overwhelmed with the awe and the wonder I was feeling in discovering all these things about a wider variety of animal lives. And I briefly flirted with the idea that this was a spiritual experience. And I, that didn't really resonate with me in the long run. I think that I do feel awe and I do feel wonder, but that it is very much a sense of connection with nature. I do feel that. I do feel the bigger than the human, but only at the level of the fact that you know, nature is everywhere. We are part of nature. We are surrounded by profoundly cognitive and emotional beings, not spirituality for me. Yeah. I, and I feel very much the same way. I think, you know, reality is more awesome and more wondrous than any fabrication, frankly. You know, it's, um, reality is amazing enough. So, and I think that feeling emotionally is probably very similar to what many people um, describe when they're talking about spirituality or even a religious experience. But yeah, I think for you and me, it's grounded in a naturalistic understanding of the reality we, we share or, rather than thinking there has to be something else as a source, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are times, I can remember a couple of times particularly when I'm overtaken with really an embodied sense of being part of the animals that I'm watching. It's very, um, I mean, I could even, it was funny because on the tip of my tongue, I was going to say it's otherworldly, but the fact is that of course it really isn't. It's, it's our world. But there was one time when I was sitting and watching a group of gorillas and this was in captivity, which is a bit problematical for me now, this was a while ago. And they were in such sync with each other and I felt in such sync with them. It happened later in Yellowstone National Park with bison where I was uh, making sure to stay far away from them as I should, but able to feel that I was closer to them. I just felt that connection. And the only other time I've ever felt something like that was at a Springsteen concert because I'm a diehard Bruce Springsteen fan and I travel out of state to concerts and just to feel that oneness, you know, and it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And you're right that other people would use different terms to describe it. And I have been informed by other people that I was having a spiritual experience. And I tell them, you know, actually, no. <laughs> It's a different way of understanding, it. yeah, but it's no less powerful, yeah. no yeah. less powerful. That's right. And you, That's right. you touched on, it was interesting how you described your focus, I guess, on, you know, certain species, and you almost had a, you were trying to move away from anthropocentrism, but you still had a sort of centrism around the other great apes. And uh, uh, clearly they, they often go together because it is quite tempting to assess the validity and the worth of, you know, non-humans based on how like us they are. And 
in, in, oh, yeah. in, in a way you can understand that that's you know it's, it's hard to avoid completely because we are human so we will start with our perspective and personally you know my understanding of my own sentience is is where a lot of those things start um but that, i think you're right there's, there's almost a trap there that you therefore start to use the human as the the sort of measuring stick and assess everything else against us and that's not necessarily the um you know the deepest way of understanding the value of non-human sentience well you've really put your finger on a, a major conundrum in my own work uh, i have written seven books now on animals and i guess in a sense my my sort of breakthrough moment um not only in terms of getting a book out to the public but in my own understanding of what i wanted to be doing with narrative storytelling was how animals grieve which came out in 2013 and I was asking of myself, where can I find good evidence, really scientific evidence of the expression of grief in other animals? And I went on from there to write a book about farmed animals, largely asking how we can understand their sentience and cognition to know that, for example, goats and chickens and pigs and cows really are smart. So I ended up, you know, reading a whole lot of experiments like goats can solve uh, a task box problem. They have to go through various steps to unleash a tree in a box and they can remember this for a certain number of days and chickens can remember faces and cat. And, you know, in a way it's all asking, can animals do what we can do? And in one way that's important because it is a way of storytelling that reaches people. It gives them a way to see that we are not really as unique as we like to think. In the other sense, it's dangerous because we don't want to only define animal emotion and cognition in our own terms. So I have tried very consciously, and this is, I think, more evident in my new book, Animals Best Friends, to say we need to just try to look at animals and ask what they can do that we can't do. How, but how do we ask ourselves if we can't imagine a way of being in the world? And there's, this is where uh, thinking about invertebrates has really helped me. Thinking about octopus, thinking about spiders. I mean, we know that octopus have distributed cognition, right? They have a brain, of course, but they also have these amazing eight arms along which all these neurons are distributed so that when they're exploring the world with their arms, they're thinking. And being able to, to really think with octopus in a certain sense that they flash their moods on their skin with their chromatophores, that when they're using their arms, they're thinking, it gets me out of that human box. I was able to meet some octopus behind the scenes at the New England Aquarium. And this was, again, a very fraught encounter for me. I was very grateful to have the opportunity, but I was also realizing that I didn't really think these octopuses should be in captivity. But this was considered by the aquarist in charge to be an enrichment experience for the octopus, that it would be not seen by the public and it would be the octopus individual's choice to come to me and meet me. And this giant Pacific octopus named the professor did choose to come and wrap an arm around my arm, at which point I felt that here is an individual animal who is thinking with his arm about me evaluating me with his arm. And, you know, just having that experience was really, really helpful for beginning to get away from that human standard. So that's an example where I'm trying to kind of push myself to do both things, to meet people and say, look, you guys can do this and so can a goat, but also to say, hey, none of us can do this and this octopus can, and this is how amazing the world, the natural world is. It's a powerful balance, yeah. And we'll come back to this topic of understanding, I guess, the other, particularly the non-human other as well. And, and that's a key part of this second deep question, you know, what and who matters? And you and I share, you know, an, a naturalistic way of understanding the world. And an, a challenge that is often uh, put in front of people with a naturalistic worldview is, OK, well, how do you ground your ethics? What is good and bad for you? Because you don't have a you know, supernatural being or a book or a deity telling you what's good and bad. So what is ethics? You know, you know. You're presumably not running around pillaging and um, you know being a completely selfish. So you know why is that, and what are your ethics grounded on? So 
that's the essence of this second question. Firstly, you know, how do we ground our ethics in a naturalistic way of understanding? But secondly, and you've hinted at this already, what's our scope of moral consideration and how does that change over time? So again, it's interesting to wind the clock back and understand your sort of philosophical journey, particularly how your, I guess, your ethics and your morality changed if it did as you left the religious worldview, but then how did it develop in terms of scope of moral consideration over time too? Um, I think where, you know, my sense of right and wrong comes from and, and what matters and what's real all goes back to community and compassion and just, I mean, I'll get to the idea that I, I mean a multi-species community, but just for the moment to start with the sense of community that, you know, what, what matters, I think, is seeing each other, seeing who needs help, who can offer help. We are all going to be in a place in our lives at times when we need help or we can offer help and just coming together as a community to really see where the harms are. And the theme of this new book that I have is to say, if we can open our eyes to harms in our various communities, we can turn them into opportunities to help. And I think it is helpful to wind the clock back because, you know, we were talking about my being raised uh, in a family that went to church certainly kindness was a value in my family. And I was explicitly taught that we are good to the pets in our home. I grew up always with cats and had a dog. And, you know, if I was a little rough as a young child, it was made very clear to me that this is not to happen. And, you know, we are kind to other children and, and all of this. And yet looking back, of course, I realize that we were doing this while we, maybe we were having a dinner conversation while we're passing around the chicken, the turkey, the meatloaf. And this was never problematized or questioned. We would have discussions about kindness to animals and then go to a, a, a trip, a day trip to the Bronx Zoo where we would see captive elephants and, you know, on and on. So this is not in any way to suggest that this is the fault of, of individuals like my parents in this family system. This was the 1960s and it was again in the air. But as I began to expand my own understanding away from only primates to see other animals being important in my work and therefore in my own circle of compassion, I began to realize that our community you know, had to be grounded in really seeing all of these creatures and not just the ones that we have as companions in our homes or that are convenient for us to include. So that's one, one part of the answer. And to go back to where, where you and your family started from, you know, that essentially is the default for nearly everybody. <laughs> um, and, and I think it flows both through, uh, you know, a religious worldview, but also a non-religious worldview. And, and it isn't without compassion for non-humans, but it's driven by a sense of, you know, uh, humans are the ones that really matter. And uh, we may deign to show compassion to non-humans where it suits us, but it's conditional, you know, it's, it's, and it's based on our definition of, you know, their role and our relations with them and how we would like to work with them and use them. So that's why the, it can be, selective compassion to companion animals and certain charismatic wild animals but certainly not to farmed animals or vermin or invasive species and so on but it, it feels to me that it's too simplistic to say humans don't have com by default don't have compassion for non-human animals i think they do but it's a it's a compassion that still comes out of you know this anthropocentric seeing humans as the be all and end all of all value and in a religious worldview that is you know the dominion the humans have a soul uh, so it's an interesting balance, and it is a fundamental shift, as you said, between that sort of, if you like, somewhat patronizing conditional granting of consideration and a fundamental identification with the other individual. Well, yes, I, you know, in my home where kindness was being taught, we would never have thought to question eating a chicken or squishing a spider. And one of the things uh, that I've written about is how much I've fallen in love with spiders and just thinking about how it was a knee-jerk response. You know, they're, they're vermin, they're in the way, we're going to kill them. Whereas now I spend time watching the uh, orb weaver spiders that come to Virginia at, at late every summer and I read about and write about spiders. Well, at the same time, I realized that, 
you know, I kill fleas, I kill ticks. I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because I still draw a line. It's just a very, very different sort of line. So um, the two ways in which I have been really asking myself about my own journey in animal compassion involve eating animals and thinking about the use of animals in science. I would say 15 years ago, I was still pretty much eating everyone just uncritically, you know, and that's not very long ago. And now I'm pretty close to vegan. I do have some really chronic health issues that make it difficult for me to be fully vegan. And sometimes I just screw up, you know, I can't excuse it in any way, but we in this house are, you know, very much in, invested in don't eat meat. We don't eat a lot of dairy. And that came out of this gradual expansion of, of understanding that these animals, you know, want to live. So I, I'm at a point now where I'm talking to people who will say, yeah, um, I really care about humane slaughter and I don't want to eat from factory farms. And so that's the kind of line drawing that interests me now because I can't make sense anymore of the phrase humane slaughter. When, for example, a pig who clearly um, can suffer or flourish, clearly can have a good day or a bad day and would live to be 15, 16 years is killed at six months. And the idea that, okay, it's humane slaughter does not compute because this animal wants to live. And there, that whole, I mean, I feel so deeply about this that it becomes difficult for me to be the person I want to be and really be compassionate, not just to farm animals, but to people who are doing what I did 15 years ago. So it, it is something that I struggle with a lot because I don't want to be that, that preacher. I don't want to be that person. And at the same time, as an anthropologist and an advocate, I grapple with this idea that, you know, the world needs to go plant-based. And that is so simplistic because if we're not offering the world alternative proteins that are affordable and accessible, then this whole project is not, is a non-starter because, you know, having lived in Africa, I realize how many millions of people feed their families from protein from the sea, from raising chickens and pigs, you know? So it's great to say that we should be eating plant-based and for me to feel that passion. But if it's not possible for the world's people to do that, then, you know, we're not really talking about global food justice. Yeah, yeah. And we'll come back to that in the final question about how to drive positive change in the future. Your journey to appreciating the, I guess, the moral value of non-humans as well, you I think for me, it took a, plenty of time as well. And, and that sense of remembering who you were before, you know, we weren't bad people before, we were products of our social environment and the context we'd grown up in and our own biases and intellectual failures and so on. So I think that is a great source of compassion when we're dealing with other people who are, you know, still thinking about it or haven't started thinking about it. Um, but was that, um, a, did you find that a difficult journey, both practically and socially and emotionally to sort of actually change your, go from this position where you had a sort of theoretical compassion for non-humans to actually driving the implications of that through into your life? Practically, in some ways, um, difficult, I guess. Um, having a life partner who was thinking the same way as, as I did was, was really wonderful. And raising a child who was very, very open um, to this and has always been deeply invested in social justice made my little bubble of where I lived, made it sort of, sort of easy. But, you know, I have to admit, in the beginning, I did have a lot of food cravings that uh, were based on the fact that I'd been eating a certain way. I had certain comfort food. Chicken pot pie was my comfort food, you know. So on a very small, I guess, non-significant level, there were practical issues. The harder things are for me now in wanting to understand how people can't see the planetary crisis, the climate crisis, the animal suffering crisis, and all these other things and act. So I sometimes worry about what you were talking about, the idea that this should be a source of compassion, that we were not always the people we are today. But I often fail in that because I'm impatient. You know, I think the, the animals are waiting, right? And 
And so I try to write and speak with a great deal of humility because I screw up so often and I'm not always the advocate that animals need. And I'm fully aware that even eating the way I do is no panacea, that animals are still hurt by the fact that I eat vegetables. But, but the, so the really, the, the moral conundrum and the hardest part of this for me is just trying not to sort of grab people and say, this is urgent, this is a crisis. And it doesn't matter that you do X, Y, and Z the way that I do, but if people aren't trying, aren't engaged, aren't in some way trying to change, you know, who they eat or helping others in some way, it just makes me a bit crazy. And that, that's a problem though. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that's a great thing. It's not something that I admire in myself. Yeah. And it's, and it, it is difficult because I think when, once you've seen an issue like this from, and you're on the other side of it and you look back, it's so obvious it's so obvious and it's so egregious. The harm is so egregious and so easy to stop that it's, it does lead you very naturally and directly. And I can imagine advocates in you know, many human social justice causes feel just the same way where it's like, how can you not get this, right? So it leads you naturally into that preaching, strident, moralizing you know, tone. Um, and I guess that's the eternal difficulty is while I think that approach of advocacy does help drive some people. It's just not enough. It's just not fast enough. And for many people, it turns them off and it becomes this sort of polarizing, you know, in-group, out-group thing where you can actually push people away. So that's one of the eternal challenges that I think, you know, we'll come back to on the, on the final question. Um, before we come off this question of moral scope, you, you touched on the environmental crisis and, and the climate challenges. And, um, I think I share your frustration that, you know, this is just another line of argument that should lead us in the same direction, for example, against, you know, away from animal agriculture. But, but there's, uh, I think there's a couple of reasons why that doesn't operate as effectively. And again, some of it comes back to this idea of moral scope, I think. So some people will challenge a sentientist worldview and say, look, you're going too far. We need to just, you know, humans matter and that's it. That's the end of the ethical story in terms of scope. And you and I would reject that clearly uh, on the basis there are, you know, maybe quadrillions of other beings that have a perspective and they can suffer and they can flourish. And there's no rational reason to exclude them from moral consideration, just as there's no rational reason why we would arbitrarily exclude a subgroup of humans from moral consideration either. So, you know, I think you and I will agree on that at least, although most of the rest of the planet you know, might differ. But some people challenge it and say, look, you haven't gone far enough. And one of the first times the word sentientism was used, it was criticized for being discriminatory because it was coming from a, a biocentrist or an ecocentrist point of view saying, you know, what about the non-sentient beings or the non-sentient stuff, right? Like plants, rocks, rivers, ecosystems, habitats, the earth as Gaia. Um, how do you think about people who want to go beyond sentience in terms of granting moral consideration? I'm often um, challenged by people who think that I neglect plants and that plants should be part of our moral scope. I don't disagree with that. I mean, certainly we know tree communication, uh, plant interconnectivity is very moving to me. And I do think that we must care clearly for the plants in our world. I mean, they are our oxygen, they're very important. I don't see an equivalence between plants and animals in the sense of their experience. And so for me, because we can only do sort of so much in the world, I encourage other people to do what they will with plants, but it is not something that I feel in that deep sense is, is an urgency of care, certainly, but not an urgency in the universe of sentientism. So, you know, um, I'll try to make this brief and you can stop me if I'm off on a tangent, but I am challenged by people who say, you know, why aren't you working for humans when there's so much human suffering in the world? And my answer to that is that I think I am. I truly believe that because of the one health, just one health perspective of connectivity, that I am. So my, my recent work has very heavily focused on working towards animal-free biomedical science. 
owing to the cruelty of animals in laboratories, you know, not only the 75,000 monkeys that are in the United States laboratories, but all the right, the rats and mice, dogs, cats, ferrets, and so on. And when I say that the science of the future, very near future, is better science with animal-free methods, I feel that I'm working for human health as much as I am against animal cruelty. And that argument parallels with almost anything I could think of with animals in agriculture, animals in zoos, you know, compassionate conservation instead of lethal management in the wild. So I just wanted to kind of get that in there. And I think, I think that's a very, very important point for sentientism, that it's not excluding um, working for humans in any way. It's all of a piece. Yeah, humans are sentient beings too. Yeah, completely agree. And I, and I think that's one of the central things about this final question, you know, how, how can you make a better world? Um, and before, before we come on to that, I just wanted to tie up that point you made about you know, plants and the ecosystem and the environment. I, I'd share that view that, you know, plants, ecosystems, environments are all richly important. So even a strictly sentientist view, and I tend to be quite strict, absolutely cares about all of those things, but it cares about those things because of their impact on the sentient beings. But I, again, I'd agree. I think there's an enormous complexity in plant behavior and we should keep an open mind about uh, as we learn more about them and you know, fungal networks and so on. Um, but the science I've seen so far, as you implied, gives no sense that they have a subjective experience, right? So they're, they're rich, they communicate, they can behave in more complex ways than we might've thought. But so far we have no basis to think that you know, if you pull a if you pull a branch off the tree, the tree actually experiences something in the way that if you you know harm a pig or a cat or a octopus, it, there is a, another being there, you know, explicitly sen sensing and feeling uh, something negative. So I think that is a critical difference. Yeah, and I think I so so I'm I'm quite open minded. If people want to go beyond sentience and and think richly about non sentient stuff that's fine with me. The thing that frustrates me most is when people who go beyond sentience and talk about the environment and climate do so in such a way that explicitly still excludes vast tranches of sentient beings, both in the wild and in farms from their consideration. And that I genuinely don't understand. And it gives the lie to the fact that many people's environmentalism is really just a veneer on anthropocentrism. You know, it's, I like the environment because I enjoy looking at it and walking around in it and my nature programs. And I like nature because I need these ecosystem services and I need a reliable temperature and I need the sea level in the right place. But again, all of those really draw back to human concerns. They're not really an extension of moral scope whatsoever. Whereas others I think who are thinking about one health or are thinking about compassionate conservation, I think are, you know, share my concern for the wider environment but it's grounded in the compassion for the sentient beings. Uh, you know, that's the ultimate motivation. But. I, I just totally agree. And I, my, my work just this morning before we began to talk uh, has to do with, you know, really questioning the traditional conservation practice of lethal management to where culling is a go-to strategy so often. If in doubt, that, if in doubt, that, kill them all. I mean, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was just a, a particularly egregious example came up this morning and I was writing with a, a newspaper reporter and we're going to try to make a move on something. But it, it is that example where you're, where you're saying that these are these are nature lovers saying, you know, I want to maintain this ecosystem and then they're, you know, taking um, high powered rifles and blowing away animals. You know, there's there's something wrong there. Yeah. Yeah. For the good of the species, for the good of the population level, for the, for the good of the the system, but ignoring individuals. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the other th themes that flows through some of these conversations is, and part of the reason I like to link this ethical question back to the epistemology, because I think there are many, um, you know, supernatural or poorly founded beliefs that don't really have a negative impact, but there are some that drive a really warped, dangerous ethics. And one of those is where you put something as more important than sentient beings and the suffering and flourishing and life and death of sentient beings so in a religious context that might be a god or a priesthood or something else but in the environmental context often it can be ecosystems habitat the systems the earth as gaia and this superordinate thing is so important it can justify causing enormous suffering and even death to you know many sentient beings um, and that's that's a warping i think is deeply damaging and i think that's partly why i like to link these two concepts is you know, one, a naturalistic understanding that means you recognize that most of those higher power things just don't really exist in a meaningful sense. But two, making sure that, you know, sentient beings are the moral grounding of all the things we think about. But uh, 
Yeah, well said, Jimmy. Mm. But the final question, and you've hinted at it already, is how you know how can you make a, the world a better place or even the universe a better place? So I think we find ourselves in this odd situation where both you and I share a broadly naturalistic worldview. I think we broadly share a sort of sentiocentric compassion that we care about beings that have the capacity to suffer and flourish. But most of the 7.8 billion people on the planet disagree with us on one or both to some degree. Um, so um, how do you feel about you know, our prospects for, for a better future for all sentient beings in that context. It depends on the day you ask <laughs> yeah. me. Um, you know, I heard the other day, I wish I could remember where someone say, I'm an activist. I don't have the luxury of uh, proceeding without hope. And that's kind of how I feel that in order to for us to collectively do what we do, I think we have to, to hope. And the only slight question I would turn back to you is, is it really that people on the earth disagree or have they not really been exposed in a lot of contexts to, to these questions? And I think that that's why I have hope about the continued sort of combination of two things, the outreach of the science-based storytelling that I do think matters to reach people so that they know more about the animals with whom they're sharing the earth. And secondly, these really practical changes that collectively so many people are working on, plant-based foods, cultured or cellular meat. I, I'm a fan of all tools in the toolbox for whatever alternative proteins we can get out to the world. And I think that if we can focus particularly on animal agriculture and ride this wave, there's so much fascination among younger people all around the world with being able to escape cruelty when we eat. I do think there's hope there. So that the, the world, thinking of the future of food and a vision of, of the world, you know, maybe I'm not so much thinking it's, we're all going to be vegan as that this idea of being reducitarian, Brian Caitlin's turn, reducitarian, where we're significantly trying to cut back in big ways on eating meat, seafood, and dairy can really make a difference. And to me, that is really kind of job one and question one. If we don't have you know, a habitable earth, we can't get to a lot of these other questions because we're going to be consumed with global warming in an in an uninhabitable planet. So I do think that if we work on the eating, the future of food, the dietary question, I think that would be a channel for seeing the future, hopefully. That's my starting point. And of course, you know, I know this is basic, but I say to people all the time, you wanna make a difference in the climate crisis three times a day, what you eat, there it goes. You can help animals, be kind to animals, you can be a sentient advocate and you can do it in your own home. So, you know, I really feel that so strongly. And from there, we can just take, you know, issue by issue and keep going and educate, educate, talk to people, talk to youth, talk to kids. They're there, they're open to nature. We know this, we know that they feel these things. So I do see that the world can change. And I'm not ignoring the fact that there's whole swaths of the world's population that wants meat. So this is one reason why I think it is a mistake to be very elitist and turn away from the types of cultured cellular bioreactor vat-based meat that we are beginning to think about. I'm a big fan of the Good Food Institute in Washington, DC, and what they're doing globally to try to get alternative proteins to the world. Okay, that's one piece of it. Now, where should I go from here? <laughs> I, I, I think it's a great story. And I, I share that um, optimism in a way because social norms are so powerful, right? It sometimes just feels like a brick wall in the way. And, and really that's just a societal pattern of parents and schools and society and marketing and you know, everything else. Um, repeating established patterns and it's very hard it feels very hard to change them but the, the things that give me optimism one is because I, I do think there's a sort of latent ethics that sits behind that that i think you can see 
in most children. So I think, you know, I don't want to be too naive about, I don't think children are some sort of perfect vessel that is then warped by society. But I think most young children, when they grow up, one do have quite a naturalistic understanding of the world. You know, they're using their senses to try and understand reality, engage with it honestly, and try and work out what the hell's going on. You know, they sometimes feel like mini scientists in a way, not formalized, but, um, but I think on the ethical side, you know, yes, of course, you know, there are kids who out of curiosity will pull the wings off insects and so on. But I think there is a, a latent compassion there as well that it, you talked about the evolutionary and written about the evolutionary uh, roots for that, that were, you know, many tens of millions of years before humans came on the ground and came on the scene as well. So it does feel like there is this sort of latent basis for naturalism and a latent basis for a, actually a cross species compassion that you'll see in most young children as well. And I think that even flows through, despite all the social norms, into adulthood. So the Sentience Institute did some survey work recently that showed a remarkably high proportion of just average US adults who were against factory farming. And I think 47% who thought that slaughterhouses should be banned. Now, how many of them had carried through the implications of what that would mean You know, is a difficult, different question. But there is a, a latent ethic there that I think in their hearts of hearts, many more billions of people agree with this sentiocentric compassion than carry it through into their daily lives. And I guess the final thing that gives me um, uh, some optimism and hope is that, again, as you've talked about, these things aren't trade-offs, right? We don't have to necessarily make a sacrifice to make a positive change. These changes are good for us too. You know, there are often win-win-wins for humans, non-humans, and the environment, certainly in animal agriculture. But I'd agree with you on the increasingly on the animal testing and research front. One of my again previous guests, Saisha Akhtar, who I'm sure you know. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, her message is one. Of course, it's more compassionate for the non-human animals, but it's actually better science and it's better for us humans as well. So, so I think the combination of that sort of latent positive ethic, that um, you know, win-win-win opportunity, that means you know, it, it, all of us can do well out of it. And also, when you look back through history and you see that you know, changes are always slow and frustrating for those driving them, but they can change really quickly, right? And if you can if you can make that change easy, both through social norms and acceptability, through alternative products like the you know, Good Feed Institute and all, many other firms are trying to develop, if you can make it easier to do the right thing, I think you know, we might look back in a few decades and be surprised at how quickly things have changed. Yeah, I do believe in that idea of a turning point with a critical kind of mass. And so here, um, you know, I'm in Virginia and recently KFC, the fried chicken company, brought out plant-based chicken in 400 outlets in the United States. And this was very interesting to watch what sort of happened in the vegan, vegetarian, vegetarian community, because a lot of people were sort of saying, you know, ah, I'd never go to KFC. They're bad, bad company. I don't want my food to be touched by like frying in oil that's, you know, animal products. And the type of response that I really resonated with were people who were saying, this is great. This is not for us. This is not for people who, you know, who are already vegan or nearly vegan. It's for the rest of the world. And we need to, to support the fact that there, this is going to help the tipping point. This is going to bring products and different ways of thinking to more people. And I really want to get on board with that kind of marriage, again, of bringing stories to people about individuals because I think that our empathy and our compassion response is activated when we hear not just about cows, chickens, pigs, but individuals and the same thing with animal research and saying, look, this is great for you. Why is this better for you to eat this plant-based stuff? You know, and I, I really, I, I have to feel that we have a real chance for exactly what you're saying, 10 years on a different way of being in the world. And I think there's an interesting balance. This is a timeless and often fiery debate in the animal advocacy community between, this is an unfair way to characterize it, between, I guess, if you like, the purists, the abolitionists, um, who are deeply frustrated at reduced vegetarianism and welfare initiatives and are insisting on uh, the end to all animal exploitation. And um, their view is, we have a clear moral stance, it's incontrovertible, uh, and the, cap, the, the challenge to them is, but you're actually not going to achieve your aims as effectively as you might 
by engaging with the people who don't quite get it yet. Then you have the, another camp, and it's not really a camp, right, who are more about you know, reduction, welfare, incremental changes, reaching out to the people who don't quite see it. We've got to drive these changes. Um, and the challenge to them, I think, is, look, this is a really clear cut and dried ethical issue. How can you see increments as positive? And what sits behind that, I think, is a worry that by taking a more incremental, more outreach, more, you know, more polite, more friendly, more engaging tone, we might persuade more people, but then we'll get stuck in some sort of dead end where we've still got mass scale agri animal agriculture. We've just done another round of ethics washing and everyone now thinks it's all humane because we've got rid of cages and so on. And, 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 and you know, everyone's doing meatless Mondays and maybe meatless Tuesdays as well. Oh, isn't that wonderful? And there'll be a dead end. So, and, and I don't think it is. I think, I think the answer in a sense is, in my mind, both right so i think we need the moral clarity we need the identification with the individual victims and the understanding of the wrongness of the things that are being done right we need that clarity and that purity and that drive but i think if we really want to do the best for the non-humans we're trying to help we also in terms of practical terms often have to engage more practically more incrementally find ways of helping people bring you know bring them on a journey make us make this look like an encouraging exciting positive you know wonderful thing to come and join us in doing and it and it is difficult because it feels almost you know when you see this issue you get rid of a lot of cognitive dissonance and it's quite freeing but it almost feels that as an advocate you almost need to take on that deliberate cognitive dissonance because it feels like you need to sort of park that moral purity thing in your mind it has to stay there because that's the ultimate goal but you've got to find more constructive ways of engaging. And it's like you say, it's really hard to do. And you know, my snarkiness on Twitter, you know, will, will always escape sometimes. <laughs> and well, I also think if I could add one thing, I think it's very contextual because when it comes to animals in laboratories, I am done with welfareism. I'm done with the bigger, better cage. And I am pushing for, you know, abolition, right? Uh, along with my colleagues, I am working with a bunch of people uh, towards a Belmont report for animals that will be parallel to the Belmont report that, report that protected human subjects um, decades ago. And the idea is that we know that animal-free methods are already here and coming online, you know, organs on chips and tissue work with, you know, using humans as the animal model, right? We're animals, we're the animal model. And I don't, I don't have a lot of patience with welfareism, but when I turn to animal agriculture, what people are eating, my own personal sense is that um, failing to meet people where they are is a total failure. You know, with science, we're, we're working with, we want to restructure the funding sort of initiatives to make sure that these so-called alternative models, the animal free methods are getting more funding, getting more attention in Congress. There are paths there to work sort of strictly on the evidence and the reason and let's get going. When we're talking about what people eat, you know, um, I, I went to a lecture from an animal activist who said, look, you're in uh, the mall and you're walking past the food court and you see someone eating a chicken sandwich, go up to that person and tell them why it's wrong. I will never do that. That's just not going to work in my view. That doesn't mean that I'm content with incremental steps, but it means that the way that I am going to reach out is by saying, first of all, there's fantastic plant-based foods that is going to make this not a sacrifice at all, but to really say, like if you're not just doing Meatless Monday, but if you're really working to reduce, that's a tremendous contribution. I admire it. I'm impressed with it. And I refuse to be worried about 100%, you know, it, wanting 100% from every individual I meet because that is not going to work. Yeah. And I, I also think things will change over time because the more people disconnect from these systems, realize they can do it and free themselves from it, it becomes much easier to adopt a moral stance. It's so hard to condemn something when you're habitually, you know, a participant in that. So I think over time, you probably will see a shift from people cutting down, reducing and, and shifting in a way, but then it, it will actually become, you know, the social norms will shift around and people will start to look at what remains and go, is that really justifiable anymore? And I think you'll see a maybe a, a little bit more purity and clarity coming in as the social norms shift. Um, and the other reason I think um, it's important to think particularly intelligently about the, the food and diet aspect of this, partly, you know, its scale is one obvious reason to focus on it. But one reason for some sensitivity is partly because it's so richly infused into 
cultural and traditional meanings for many people. Um, that's not a reason to stop it, but it just means we need to change our tactics and our communication to help people understand where we're going. But also, and you touched on this, when you think globally, there are many communities where they frankly don't, just don't really have a viable alternative at the moment. Um, so for us, so for us to sort of pile in with a simplistic assumption based on me living in London, who has you know a supermarket and a, that can deliver you know a breathtaking array of um, you know amazing plants, fruits, and vegetables, and all the alternatives I want as well, that just isn't the case for billions of people around the world. So I don't think that shifts the our appreciation for the harms that are being done and are the non-human victims that are being impacted, nothing mitigates that. But in thinking about how to change that pattern, you've got to think about you know, viable transition paths and ideally just transition paths that make it you know, easier and practical and give you know, human communities around the world many various and different ways of coming to a less harmful you know, way of thriving themselves. Um, and that needs some real sensitivity. Yeah, and I also credit Sonora Taylor and her beautiful book, uh, Beasts of Burden, that talks about animal liberation in conversation with disability liberation, because there are people who simply can't eat the way that their ideals and principles might, you know, align with. In other words, they wish they could eat differently, but their bodies are simply preventing them from eating differently. And I, um, I, I, I'm on the periphery of, the, of that community, but after such a very difficult experience with an aggressive cancer and surgery and radiation and chemotherapy and years of side effects and years of chronic health issues, I feel that, you know, I can say sometimes we cannot eat the way we want to eat. And I think that is also a global issue. So that this is the one reason why, you know, I try to be very careful when I walk through that mall court, which I don't actually do, but were I to do that and see someone eating chicken at, you know, you, you can't always know. It is a harm that you're seeing, but also, you know, what harm have you done that day and why? So it really is a, a compelling thing to say, we are grounding our ethics in compassion. So let's try to really be comprehensive and not forget the compassion of dealing with other people with whom, you know, we just don't know what they're living through. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and I guess a, a final question. Um, we focused understandably on, I guess, the non-human world, uh, given it's neglected, given its scale, given it's pretty obvious to you and me, you know, the types of things we need to do to, to fix it. How do you think the non-human problems we've talked about relate to intra-human ethics as well? Do you think there's a, a conflict or a challenge there? Do you think there's a synergy? Um, how do you think the two relate? As we said, you know, humans are sentient beings too, and we have many problems within our own species to deal with. I, I think it's a synergy because the more we train ourselves to see another being's experience day by day, the better we are placed to make a positive difference. And I do believe that my career, which is very grounded in looking, listening, stilling myself to try to understand to the best of my ability what another being might be experiencing within the limits of my own ability to do that is very helpful for dealing with people and understanding other people's experiences and seeing you know, the, the harms and the vulnerable abilities that are there uh, in the world. I am very um, much concerned with homophobia and transphobia particularly. I happen to live in a, a very, you know, Southern United States conservative community where the kind of citizen generated perspective is that we're a wonderful place to live. We're a loving community. Well, we're also a community that became famous because a high school student tried to have the right to use the bathroom that is, you know, consonant with his gender. He was assigned female at birth, uh, but Gavin Grimm, this is very famous um, young teenager uh, who really changed the United States in terms of thinking about access of high school kids to their bathroom. And you wouldn't believe the outpouring of not just intolerance, but hate in this community studded with churches. Everywhere you look in my town, there are churches and people proclaiming that we're a loving community. And this is a, you know, a, a community that eats tons of animals. It doesn't think a lot about animal uh, sentience. But I also see this incredibly deeply rooted transphobia and homophobia 
And I'm not sure how well I can articulate this, but I do see so much synergy in terms of really looking at vulnerable individuals and how they are simply not seen by a lot of people who go about their life, you know, in a very kind of comfortable, not only anthropocentric way, but, you know, it's certainly race, gender, class is all caught up in this. And so I live in a place where I'm very much aware that what is proclaimed to be loving kindness is a screen for what really isn't. And, you know, this case with Gavin Grimm, who was a very brave person, uh, went through the courts and my community was ordered to pay over a million dollars in court fees because this is discriminatory. It's against Title IX, it's against the constitution. You know, so, so the right outcome happened, but again, uh, you know, everybody was, was, was fighting it. And so why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because my whole focus of where to make change is the community, right? And so this is the community in which I live. So I work all day long on animal issues, but I can't close my eyes to the fact that there is a harm going on in this community because every kid here who is gay, queer, trans, you know, sees this and understands that they're not seen, that they're not valued and that matters. And so I think we can work on these things kind of of a piece. We have limited energy, but they are, they're meshed together because they're about who a being is the intrinsic value of a being who is sentient in this world and deserves a place and deserves to flourish. Yeah, beautifully put. Thank you. And, it, and I draw it back to, you know, you, you introduced our, you know, what matters question by talking about community and compassion. And, and that's part of the danger with just the just community is because it's often easy to exclude from that community. Um, and I think that's why you know, compassion has to drive through that, as you said, that identification with the other, the, their perspective, the, the meaningfulness and the, and the value of their own experience has to cut through the conditionality and the, and the in-group, out-group boundaries that we apply. Um, and and I, I totally agree. I mean, in a way, that's partly why I'm trying to promote this sort of sentientist idea, because I like the idea of thinking of us as um, as sentientity, if you like, like an extension of humanity. It's, it's not just humans over here and non, non-human animals over here, and we have our own problems. There's remarkable amounts of commonality. And the, the core to me is that essential identification with the perspective of the other, which to me is the essence of really what morality and ethics should be, right? Is the appreciation of the perspective of the other and, and the decision to care about that. And that is something we can do across you know the breathtaking diversity of humans but it's also something we can do across you know all sentient beings so um... yeah maybe a good place for me to end would be not with my own words but to quote a colleague the anthropologist eduardo Cohn, who wrote an amazing book called how forests think and this is the closest i can get to quoting so it may be a paraphrase but this is the idea he said the world is not a meaningless one made meaningful by humans you know, the world is the world. We are part of the world, but we don't give meaning and value to the world. That is there through all the beings who inhabit it. And as an anthropologist, what I want to work on is anthropology beyond the human and the whole multi-species community. And I think we, 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 we can't deny humans power and um, potential for good and ill. We can't deny that with that power should come responsibility. But at the same time, we can balance that with some humility, which I think you do beautifully, of recognizing that, you know, sentience was around for many hundreds of millions of years before humans came on the scene. And arguably, proto-naturalism and proto-morality were around a long time before humans came on the scene. And when you look around the planet today, you know, we're a vanishingly tiny proportion of the sentient beings that are here. So fine, we're important, but, you know, we've got to put ourselves in that context as well. Yeah, yeah, the power that we have is, of course, completely outsized. And I, I don't mean by in any way by um, suggest by invoking that quote to suggest that, that that is not the case. You know, the power that we have taken, that we wish to take, that we at least um, tell ourselves we have is terribly destructive. But I think that if we realize, again, this idea that we are surrounded, you know, every single day, wherever we live, by other lives where Everything that happens matters to them as deeply as what happens to us matters to us. That that, that is a, a tremendous 
comfort and a responsibility to know that. Yeah, it is. And, and that's partly why it's so important that your outreach work, the TED Talk and the seven books are driving that influence across the human species because, um, you know, largely we're going to determine the um, uh, how things play out for good or ill. So, yeah, thank you so much for all your yeah, work. Yeah, thank you. My website is www.barbarajking.com. You mentioned Twitter a few minutes ago. I'm all over Twitter about animals, and that's BJ King Ape, A P E on the end. And I'm uh, I'm findable, so I'd be love it if people would check out what I'm doing. Yeah, that's brilliant. That was exactly my question. So you anticipated it perfectly. Okay. And I'll include links in the notes okay. as well, so people can click oh, through. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for such a great conversation, Jamie. I enjoyed it. It's been a real inspiration. A pleasure to talk to you. Stay thank in you. touch. Okay, we'll do so. Okay. Thanks, Barbara.